Welcome everyone once again um, to today's webinar. So today we have a very special topic for you. We are going to talk about the role of ETF investing. And before we start right away uh, with a short introduction and then dive right into the topic, um, we want to also get to know about our audience tonight. So uh, we have a very short poll question, which I started right now. So you should see it on your screen and just let us know if you already have ETFs in your portfolio or not. So that will help us um, cater our contents more towards your specific needs. So with us tonight, we have a very special guest. So we have Anthony Arfa with us tonight, who is the head of Asia X Japan uh, Wealth Distribution uh, for iShares. So Anthony, Hello. Hello, Anthony, and thank you for, uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. And then we have our very own Vivek Mohindra, who is one of our co-founders and responsible officer uh, at Crystal.ai. Thank you, Vivek. Um, so just a quick uh, up, uh, um, overview over our webinar structure today. So the most important part is, uh, is that you have two absolute uh, experts in their field. Um, with um, answering all your questions to, tonight. So if you have any uh, questions, please use the Q&A tool um, that we have. So on your screen, either on the, on the upper level or on the bottom, you will find a, an icon called Q&A. So if you click that, you can submit all your questions and we will make sure that all of them get answered. Just in case uh, a question, like if you have any other questions, please always uh, send an email to support at crystal.ai and we will get back to you as soon as possible. And final um, hint, um, this webinar is being recorded. So just in case you have to drop off at any point, not, not a problem, or if you want to um, share this with your friends, um, we will record this webinar and you will find it together with all our past webinars on our YouTube channel. So the easiest way to find, find us on, uh, on YouTube is to just uh, head over to YouTube uh, Hit, uh, hit crystal.ai and then uh, on the playlist, you will find one playlist that is called Crystal Online. And there we will upload also this video. And we'll, uh, I will also send it out um, as a follow up to this uh, webinar as soon as the video is ready. So that's it from my side. If you have any questions, um, as, as I said, please use that Q&A tool. And without further ado, I want to now hand it over to Vivek to open our webinar for today, please. Oh, you're on mute, Vivek. Yeah, uh, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yeah. Uh, so basically, I'm just gonna you know do a, a one simple slide, which is kind of my um, uh, my personal experience with ETFs. So why did I start using ETFs? Um, I started investing about 25 years ago. So this is just you know why I started with the ETF. Can, can we get the mute on this one? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, like everybody else, I started with buying stocks and uh, shares. Uh, you know, there's a thrill associated with uh, buying stocks. And, you know, there's a lot of biases which creep in when you do it. Uh, people buy it based on a stock tape or just familiarity. For example, you know, a lot of people are obviously interested in um, buying Tesla right now because of the familiarity with Elon Musk and whatever he does. Um, so there's always an emotional bias to buying stocks and that's how everybody starts. Uh, however, there is a lot of idiosyncratic risks that come in, which I learned to, uh, very painfully uh, with Noble Group in Singapore, for example. Uh, you know, I knew, I met uh, the CEO or the owner, uh, Richard Elman, at some, a couple of times during uh, presentations, etc. So I, had, I, I thought very highly of him. And so I ended up buying Noble in my SRS account in Singapore. And then, you know, even when it was tanking, I never really actually got out of it because I had an emotional connection with that stock. So, and similarly, a lot of people in China got stuck with Luke in uh, coffee uh, just recently. So what happens with stocks is, you know, you tend to get uh, a little bit overconfident uh, and you tend to uh, not really have the ability to do the in-depth in research uh, that buying single stock often requires. In fact, uh, the Hong Kong uh, exchange did a recent survey and most of the 
uh, investors in Hong Kong end up buying tier two and tier three uh, stocks. So no, they don't even buy the you know the big blue chips like Tencent and Alibaba, but they buy that. So the risk is quite significant there. Uh, the first step was obviously I went into funds. Funds offer diversification, and actually ETFs were not really available, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So they're relatively recent phenomena. Uh, so funds had a lot of things to offer. So they offered diversification. They offered access to a lot of places where I could not invest directly. Uh, for example, Latin American markets, uh, also certain themes. Uh, and also they were very active, uh, Lee managed uh, when, when I started. So now over a period of time, people have figured out that uh, active management doesn't give you the alpha and doesn't give you the additional return uh, that uh, you know fund managers end up charging for. As a result, there has been a huge move towards passive funds and uh, also passive ETFs has really benefited from that. Uh, so with funds, the problem was always settlement. Uh, you know, you had to subscribe to each fund uh, individually, send in a check, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a little bit problematic to do all that. Uh, but it they made sense because interest rates were much higher than they are today. Uh, and, uh, you know, you don't mind, you didn't mind paying higher uh, fund fee ratio, but it was quite uh, quite a painful process. Uh, but, you know, since I held funds for a couple of years, it didn't matter that much. ETFs came almost 20, 30, 20, 20 years ago. But they were only accessible to a certain degree of investors. You had to have an account in the U.S., uh, you know, so you had a broker who could do that. It wasn't that easy as today. Uh, there wasn't enough liquidity in many of these funds initially, uh, but, um, and there were tax uh, considerations, obviously, for people investing from Hong Kong or Singapore about, uh, you know, ETFs in the U.S. Uh, but of course, the cost was significantly a, benefit, a big benefit. So effectively, everybody started buying ETFs in a certain, in a, you know, in a, uh, going ahead in a small uh, way. And so, so did I. And then once you buy ETFs, you realize that the settlement, transparency, liquidity, all is a big benefit, right? Uh, you don't have to open a different account. You don't have to interact with different funds. You can get all the information and you can do it as you were trading stocks. So that's what happened. And, I, and as... Funds made, uh, sorry, ETFs gave you a flexibility of investing in bonds as well as stocks, as well as commodities. So I could truly have an uh, allocation framework to follow. Uh, also, besides the allocation, it also enabled me to switch from conservative to aggressive to uh, set balance quite quickly. So I could do all this quite quickly. Uh, so the ETFs, you know, gave me a significant bump up when I was doing my allocation. And the final was usage, which, you know, kind of came in just a couple of years ago. And that sorted out the big problem I had in terms of uh, the tax uh, inefficiency. So once you're in Hong Kong or Singapore, you basically don't pay any withholding tax. Uh, you know, you're like uh, on dividend, you're at 15%, which is quite common on bonds on fixed income, there's zero withholding tax. Um, the liquidity is not still as much as I would like it to be because the US ETFs are the really big you know, big elephants in the room and they're the ones who actually you can trade in and out anytime. So it's not exactly where I would like it to be, but it's, it's getting there. And uh, that's why, you know, I think anybody who wants to truly have a well allocated balanced portfolio going ahead uh, will have to do it. And now I can guarantee you personally, 90% of my investments are through ETFs. And the other difference is that it's not just um, individuals, it's not retail. It's uh, high net worth individuals, it's institutional investors, it's even central banks. So if you look at Japan, the biggest investor in the ETF market in Japan was the central government themselves. And now we know that what's happening with the Federal Reserve and how much they, of ETFs they're buying uh, and through BlackRock, actually. And we'll, we'll cover that later. So it, it's no longer, um, you know, small investors trying to buy uh, allocated portfolio for a small amount of funds. I have seen a billion dollars being transacted in a single ETF. Uh, in by one investor. So, you know, we're talking about true democratization where a retail investor has access to the same thing which a federal reserve or a central government or high net worth institutional investor has. Uh, so that's the kind of background. Uh, with this, I'm going to pass it over to, uh, you know, Anthony and uh, ask him to cover a few points on his slides and then we'll come back and have a discussion on, you know, uh, how exactly we use these ETFs. Thank you. Just give a couple of minutes while he sets up his screen. Okay. 
All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. And um, thank you also for having me, Vivek. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, Vivek made a really interesting point, which is um, what we see in terms of who are the who are the investors that are using ETFs. Um, and we run a survey every year looking at uh, Asian institutions, and 65% of them said they now use ETFs uh, at the core of their portfolio for asset allocation. That doesn't mean that's what they use exclusively, but it just goes to show that um, you know you do see ETFs now being used as basic building blocks to build portfolios, and you see that right from you know the biggest sovereign wealth funds. Um, central banks, as we talked about a second ago, um, all the way to retail investors um, who are, you know, building their own retirement solutions themselves uh, or using, you know, providers like, uh, like Crystal. So if you can just see on this slide here, what, we, what it tells us is, you know, we see, uh, you know, the current ETF uh, market size at around 6 trillion. And that's been, that's been the case uh, so slightly under uh, seven trillion at the end of this year. This is a projection that was made um, a couple of years ago, uh, and we expect the market to double by by 2023. But the real story, which which Vivek really touched on, was that uh, you know e the ETF market didn't really grow uh, until you know uh, since the last 10 years is where we've seen huge growth, uh, and that's really come come about since the financial crisis. And one of the, the big drivers for that has been a reduction in the cost of ETFs, as well as a recognition that um, you know, perhaps some active managers were not providing the kind of performance that their fees warranted. And if you couple that then with fees reducing on ETFs, so let's say you might pay, perhaps for an S&P 500 ETF, you might be paying four basis points, five basis points, you then, if you think uh, that an active manager might be charging 1%, that means they have to deliver 1% outperformance before they deliver any outperformance to the investor investing in that fund. Whereas an ETF, yes, it only delivers the performance of that index uh, minus five basis points, which is, which is not very much. So um, you can see over that period of time that um, you know, whether an, asset, an active manager can maintain any outperformance uh, and the the likelihood of that continuing year after year diminishes. And there are, you know, if you look at active management, there is, you know, a high probability that you might select a manager who is not necessarily going to perform. So we we we've seen the profile of ETF investors shift, and I think you've seen some of that being driven by by regulation. You've seen that in uh, markets such as the U.S. particularly move towards fee-based advice where Invest, you know, advisors are paid to provide you know, retail investors with portfolio construction, to provide them with a portfolio which will, which will survive different market cycles. You've seen that in Australia, you've seen that in the UK, you haven't necessarily seen that in Asia, but what you have seen is a knock-on effect of that. So what's that created is created a larger ETF ecosystem and market, which in, in turn provides greater liquidity and provides greater liquidity for you know, ETFs that have lower prices. And as a consequence, you're now seeing this shift towards uh, low, lower cost providers who can build you a, a multi-asset portfolio that is driven perhaps by AI, such as, you know, such as Crystal AI, and give you a portfolio that fits your needs uh, in a much more accessible way, rather than someone trying to sell you a particular active fund for which they get uh, compensated for selling you. So, and then lastly, I think we've seen ETFs really grow in the, in the fixed income space. And this is obviously important for when you're building portfolios because classic uh, portfolio construction the theory would say that you need, you know, you, you have a sort of 60, 40 uh, equity and fixed income split in your, in your portfolio. Uh, and the fixed income part providing you some some element of downside protection as well as income uh, and the equity side providing you uh, with with the you know the, the capital appreciation the growth that you might expect uh, and you'd hope over a longer period of time um, so I guess what ECFs have done is they've taken an asset class such as bonds uh, which typically have you know really only been able to trade via a bank and also with very high minimums. So you go and try, buy, try and buy a bond today, 
that's going to cost you perhaps a hundred thousand dollars or you know a very high amount and that's only going to give you you know a bond you've got the you know single security risk uh and you know you won't be able to diversify whereas an etf as vivek touched on earlier is going to hold multiple bonds inside a portfolio uh and then as a consequence you you don't have a that single security risk and you are naturally diversified and if you combine that with different ETFs in fixed income, you can you spread that level of diversification into asset class as well. So you're diversified at a security level and at an asset class level when building these portfolios. And ETFs have made uh, the bond market accessible by taking an asset that traded only over the counter through a bank and moved it onto the exchange. So in a sense, democratizing it. So anyone can access these uh, can access bond ETFs now and access fixed income in a diversified and low cost manner in a way that they could not before. So that, I think that brings me neatly on to, you know, a couple of points. Um, you know, ETFs, ETFs do attract um, some negative, some negative press and, you know, coming from uh, BlackRock, uh, we are, um, you know, we are a, um, you know, the leading player when it comes to ETFs globally. We would obviously disagree with that theory, but I think it is worth talking about them because um, you know, that's what we're here for. Um, so I, th I think two things, two things are really raised about ETFs particularly. Uh, one, that they create uh, abnormal volatility uh, in the markets from, from which they're based. Uh, and the second uh, that typically comes up is that when you will see uh, a liquidity crunch or a crisis in the market, that people won't be able to, act, uh, to exit their positions, that they'll be stuck holding an ETF, i.e. that the liquidity that they provide and offer uh, and advertise only works on the way in and doesn't work uh, on the way out. I would like to rebuff both of, both of those theories. Uh, and in the first one, I think let's look at this, um, let's look at this slide here, uh, and you'll see we've got um, a variety of circles inside one another. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the big, large yellow circle and that's the the size of the equities market take this as indicative uh these numbers uh relate to sort of 2017 for the size of the market uh, but if you can see that very small gray bubble right at the bottom that's the size of the etf market so uh, the equity etf market i should say so equity etfs uh account for and the numbers are pretty similar 3.7 on this slide uh today it's around 3.8 billion uh, 8, 8, 3.8 trillion US dollars in assets uh, versus uh, the whole entirety of the equity market, which is 83 trillion. So the, the idea that um, the ETFs might be then causing greater volatility uh, in that market, if you can just see that their impact or their ability to influence it, uh, they are significantly smaller than the overall market. If you also if you also look at um, uh, just this is build a slide, so let's just put it together, right? Um, and if you also look at the, the the turnover of ETF versus active ETFs versus active equity funds, uh, we did some research on this a couple of years ago, and um, for every we the conclusion we came to that was for every dollar traded uh, in ETFs. $22 were traded in active management. And that's the purple, uh, that's the purple circle there. So not only is active management, which we call alpha seeking here, a significantly larger portion of the equity market, uh, they also tend to have a much higher turnover. Uh, and in consequence, a much higher ability to influence the, um, the underlying market that they cover. And then just moving on to um, bonds, um, at the time of when this slide was put together, 95 trillion US dollars was the, was the size of the total, um, the total bond market globally. And uh, ETFs account for roughly 1 trillion. So not much more than a percent of the, of the overall bond market. Uh, what we have seen is actually um, rather, than, rather than ETFs, perhaps causing volatility in the market, but they are or have been yeah, perhaps a marker of uh, and the actual price that bonds are trading. So if you think that bonds don't trade on an exchange, you have to go and get a price from a bank. 
Uh, and it may be that a particular bond does not trade for a few days, whereas that ETF is trading consistently during that period. And it may be that um, then the, the ETF, which you know, naturally is made up of people who are complete each unit, which contains multiple bonds, they are deciding what the price is for a particular bond that may not be trading. So we've seen ETF prices for, for the underlying assets lead the underlying assets themselves, which is not necessarily saying that the ETF has led them there, but more that the, uh, the, that is a reflection of the where, where the market is actually pricing those bonds. Um, so if I take you through to the next slide, uh, and if I've just addressed um, the, the theory about ETFs in volatile, creating volatility, this next slide is called how do ETFs behave in volatile markets, which really is, is this uh, addressing this theory of what happens when uh, we have these volatili vol volatility spikes in the market and how have ETFs performed in that period, i.e. have people been able to, to exit their positions. If you'll notice, the um, the green is a uh, the green line is a um, is a marker of uh, a, a leading high yield ETFs uh, create and redeem a, as a percentage of high yield cash uh, at that time. Um, what do we mean by create or redeem? That's the the process by which ETFs are you know ETF units are created. I.e., so if you want to buy into an ETF a new unit has sometimes has to be created if there's not enough available, uh, probably more an institutional problem than a retail one. The pink line is, um, is telling you uh, that what that high yield uh, ETF exchange volume was as percentage of high yield cash trades in any particular time. And you'll notice throughout these spikes here, if we go back uh, sort of 2008, 2009, you'll see that little bump uh, rises, which is a financial crisis. Um, and then you'll see European debt crisis in 2010, um, taper tantrums, remember, was happened in uh, high yield markets in 2013 with Bernanke, um, and then a high yield sell off again happened at the end of 2015, um, and then 2018 as well, we had that, uh, that sort of volatility spike at the beginning of, at the beginning of that year, uh, with, which had an issue with, uh, with the VIX index. So what you've noticed is that you'll see that um, high yield ETF trades um, much more in these periods of volatility and accounts for a much greater proportion of the market. So what we've seen in these periods is that actually investors have come in to high yield ETFs. So which, which kind of goes against the theory that people would be seeking to hit the exit. People have come in because they know that this is a place where they can access liquidity in high yield at any given time. And why these, purport, why these spikes uh, increase as you move further to the right, i.e. Uh, from 2008 to today, is that's a reflection of the growth in high yield ETFs. Uh, but also that growth has come about because they have passed these tests each number of times. And if I go back to, to sort of 2013, it was a standout moment for this uh, particular ETF because, you know, it, it oft, it you know sometimes traded 100 million a day at, on the tops, but there were there were days uh, in in over a period of about 10 days, if I seem to recall correctly, where that ETF was trading over a billion a day. Now, yeah, that was a net redemption story where investors were moving out of uh, were moving out of that. So about 80% of that was uh, each day was a uh, risk redemptions. But the point is, investors went through the ETF because it worked. And we've seen that again, particularly in, in the sell-off that we saw in March, which um, you know, really saw huge amounts of money flow out of high yield, out of investment grade fixed income. Uh, and in that period, ETFs acted as essentially the, you know, the ATM. People were able to, to sell off via ETFs. And I, you know, I think if you, if you read the Financial Times and if you've read the Financial Times over this period, there has been a high level of um, skepticism about uh, particularly ETFs, but fixed, in in fixed income ETFs in particular. And at the end of uh, this sort of period, let's sort of say um, towards the end of March um, and then into April, the FT wrote an article so effectively saying, you know, fixed income ETFs helped us through this crisis, which is a, a complete about face for that, for that publication. So I think I've, I've kind of addressed um, those two 
uh, the, those those two theories about you know what we would say are misconceptions on ETFs. So one that um, investors can't exit uh, when market conditions tighten, and then secondly that ETFs themselves are the cause of uh, market volatility. Um, I'm sure everyone has has their opinion, and very happy to take um, any questions on that or talk about it further if that's what people would like. Yeah, actually, I, that, that's really interesting because, uh, to be fair, fair, I actually didn't know some of this stuff myself. Um, I, I do, I didn't know the practical uh, experience of trading during that time. Uh, I remember 25th March and around those dates uh, when uh, basically, because we do, I mean, we have some customers who trade in bonds and we have some customers who trade in ETFs and bonds were basically, we could not get a price for bonds and some of those uh, sometimes, uh, you know, for a little while, while ETFs were still trading at that point of time. So, uh, so definitely there, that that's there. And I didn't realize that, you know, the, that the high yields ETF actually saw uh, these large flows during those dates. So that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting fact to have. Uh, but yeah, and uh, I mean, the, the fact that the Federal Reserve came in and actually supported ETFs and found that that was a good way to support the market uh, resulted in normalcy coming back very, very quickly uh, because the whole uh, volatile period only lasted a few days. Uh, and I think once they announced that they were coming in uh, to buy, uh, we were, you know, that was fine. Uh, so at this stage, I, I can see a lot of questions on the sectoral and thematic and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share one slide uh, and then we're going to do a, uh, we're going to do a, poll also at the same time uh, and then let's see uh, you know uh, so we're going to launch the poll uh, let me see where is the slide Yeah, you see, uh, that, so I'm, yeah, we're going to do a slide on what people prefer in terms of, uh, can, we, can we do the poll? Or should I do the poll? Okay, so I'm going to launch a poll on uh, the sectoral ETFs. Okay, let's have uh, one, sorry, one more uh, slide, uh, one more uh, thing, uh, poll before that. Uh, hold on. Yeah. So, uh, can people vote now? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, this is like, I mean, I, they, now there are just thousands and thousands of years, actually. Um, I think last time I saw, last number I saw was, uh, you know, of course, there's six, seven trillion of them, but there's also 7,000 of them. And almost 20% of them are in Asia. And you can kind of see, this is the quite recent one, that this Jets one actually just came up, just was introduced on June 2nd and already amassed a billion dollars in like uh, just like 10 days effectively. Uh, and there's this Bets one, which is like, again, a thematic one on sports and gaming industry. And that's kind of going crazy. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, millennials are trading, I, I have kind of started trading ETFs like they were trading stock earlier where they were, you know, exchanging tips on it and so on and so forth. So some, so some, some part of it is fluff and some part of it is to do with millennials and some part of it is to do with getting bored in, uh, due to COVID-19 at home and therefore trading these. Uh, also, there's this list of uh, top 25 ETFs. So you can see a lot of the ones of them, some of them are like, you know, uh, very sector specific uh, ones which are being traded. Uh, but of course, in terms of AUM, the largest ones are all the, you know, the uh, S and P and the uh, you know the uh, uh, world bond index, world equity index, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've got some replies. We've got almost fifty replies. I think that's pretty good. Uh, so technology and healthcare lead the way. Uh, and actually, you know, just that's quite interesting because if I look at we did a you know we do studies in terms of what ETFs our clients are going into. Uh, so a majority of our clients are actually uh, going into, I would say, 20 ETFs, uh, over, even though we have a, a few a couple of thousand in our, uh, on, our, on our platform. And uh, in terms of the asset allocation, you know, the top 5, 10, 5, 6 are quite important. And actually technology and healthcare are both, you know, rank pretty high in terms of the ETFs purchased by our clients. Uh, so, you know, it kind of reflects, uh, but of course, your, many of your clients obviously it reflects that. Uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, I think, uh, do you have any comments on this sector and the, you know, the way this thing is moving around? Yeah, uh, you know, I had a look at it on the way over actually, you know, technology, no surprise that that has, uh, that's done well, uh, continues to be, you know, a big, dry, a big, um, a big component of, uh, you know, global equity growth. 
Um, and, you know, of all the sectors, if you look at a global level, it's it's in the green. So it's still positive this year. You know, if you look at healthcare, it's, you know, on a global level, it's it's, it's actually fractionally down this year. But if you and, and, you know, interestingly, you talked about thematic CTF uh, a little earlier. Um, you know, I guess if you split that into U.S. healthcare, you'd see a much stronger picture emerge. Uh, and, you know, we've certainly seen you know, areas of innovative healthcare, immunology, for example, and there are our ETFs that you can play the immunology theme on. Um, they have had, you know, pretty good performance this year, which, you know, unsurprisingly, really, if you think about uh, the, you know, the search for a, the search for a vaccine and, you know, how people tie that investment theme into what's happening in our, in our daily lives uh, with COVID. Um, I think COVID is a good, a good launch pad. Um, you know, the, the technology piece, uh, whether that's you know people people working from home, um, you know shift towards digitization. Uh, we've seen that for more niche areas of tech as well has done well this year. Um, you know both in terms of performance and in terms of picking up uh, assets from new assets from investors. And look, and clearly gold, gold is is something that people have been talking about. And that's you know that's um, I think it was a question that was put forward right at the start of this session, which was you know what do people do for the post COVID world and you know, a lot of that, uh, it, people people have a concern about um, inflation uh, and gold, you know, gold plays its part in that. Uh, yeah, 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 actually. Yeah, that's a, that's again a very interesting point because obviously, you know, to do commodities, you it's very difficult to get commodities exposure for a retail person. Uh, so it's not just fixed income. I, I, I missed mentioning that, but it's also commodities, which is actually very important. And you know, to today's date, given the inflation you mentioned and given uh, the importance of having various things in your portfolio, uh, I think we've been advocating definitely a ten percent allocation to gold uh, and some precious metals, and that can only be satisfied to uh, in ETFs. Um, so uh, just one, one more on, on how, what is BlackRock's view on this, on, on sectors? Like, you know, are, are you like focus? Is that something which you focus on a lot? Because obviously you have some of the biggest uh, ETFs out there, but how important is sector ETFs? To you? Uh, we have a, a broad view on sectors, which would follow the sort of traditional sector allocations that you, you, know, you, you see here. Um, tech, yes. Healthcare, yes. You know, uh, companies with good balance sheets. Resilience. Uh, we often look at things through a sort of factor uh, lens as well, which you know things like uh, momentum. You know, i.e., which stocks will continue to continue to sort of follow the momentum in a market. Uh, growth. Um, you know, those are kind of factors. Actually, the ones that we're looking at now um, are value, uh, which again sort of relates to companies with strong balance sheets uh, that perhaps the you know so not value sort of. Um, um, we're looking at quality. That is a uh, value is the one that is uh, I noticed on your top 25 values is uh, perhaps not at the right moment right now. Um, so yeah, we look at quality, uh, uh, minimum volatility. Again, you know, companies that are exhibiting, you know, uh, less likely to sort of swing around like a like a cyclical stock. Um, so if we're looking at those two, and I and I guess, you know, post post COVID uh, or during this sort of whole process. And I, I noticed one of the one of the funds on your top 25, uh, sustainable investing. So that's sustainable investing has done very well during this period of time. And and some of that is because, uh, you know, as a as an investment theme, it has less exposure to things like fossil fuels. So oil has obviously been troubled. Uh, but it also has, uh, you know, a, a quality tilt to it uh you know with a uh, better governance and so you know it may be that uh, this is the inflection point where we see people start to use sustainable investing or esg etfs uh you know as more you know typical portfolio building blocks so uh though i'm going to come to this uh, fed thing because obviously you know this is this is impacting a lot of the people on the on the fixed income side so you know they have this uh, they had this facility uh, and uh, you know, since given that you are here, all purchases were made through Block BlackRock. So you know, uh, and they started. They, they announced it on March twenty third, so which was the peak of the crisis. So thankfully, that that kind of saved everybody uh, uh, in terms of the volatility at that point of time. And then they started buying on twelfth May. Uh, this credit facilities, everything through BlackRock. But of course, you know, you guys have used. Uh, you haven't just bought your own funds, thankfully. <laughs> uh, so this was the. Hold on, I have the list of funds. Let me bring it. I can get the list. 
Yeah. So these were the some. See, the, these have been the purchases so far. Uh, they just announced one uh, lot of purchases. So this was some of the purchases. I mean, of course, some of them are your own, and some of the other ones. And uh, what's your general perspective on the, you know, on these, uh, you know, on and on the fixed income buying and the Federal Reserve? Anything? Any points? Yeah. It, it, you know, it's it's um yeah it's something we get asked about a lot. Um, clearly, I work for BlackRock, and BlackRock is in charge of this program, and at the same time. Uh, BlackRock ETFs are a part of it. I would just stress that the the division that uh, that administers this program is you know is kind of ring fenced from the rest of BlackRock, so we don't know how they make their decisions. Uh, the broad guidance is that they you know would not want to take up more than twenty percent of AUM of a particular uh, ETF, uh, and they you know as a consequence, as you can see here, there are you know ETFs from a range of providers. Uh, across the high yield and investment grade space, they kind of spread out the purchasing. And um, you know, I think that purchasing is spread out really, um, it, you know, uh, so that it apportions to the AUM of, of, of the ETFs involved. Uh, and I'd also stress that BlackRock doesn't get paid uh, or don't take uh, take fees where their <laughs> where our own funds are featured in this, um, you know, in this in this per, in this credit buying program. I think you know one of the other the other things about it, and you, you mentioned that this really saved saved the day for everyone. Um, I was spending a bit of time in early April, uh, just taking clients through. This is what we saw in terms of ETF flows uh, over March, and you know ETF flows really tell you the the tail of the tape, or at least on a sort of day to day basis, and normally on a month to month basis. Um, and at the end, you know, I was taking clients through it and saying. Well, this is what we've seen into in investment grade. This is what we've seen in high yields, and clients are staggered. They're like, "Well, I thought we saw you know everything you know fly out the door sort of mid March," uh, and it was when this this purchase program that was introduced, you know, straight away, um, you know, investors across the street started buying investment grade and you know and um, high yield in anticipation of the Fed you know coming into this part of the market. So it really did. Uh, totally turn around flows over the course of one month where we saw everything go out and come back uh, in a matter of weeks. Uh, I, I have quite a lot of questions, but uh, Barbara, do, do we want to take some uh, you know, questions uh, from the participants and then you know, maybe we can come back to my mind later? Yes. Of course, we have a couple of questions um, inside our Q&A tool. Um, okay, where should we start? So maybe let's start with Okay, something we've touched upon. Um, how do you manage major risks in ETF during liquidity crunch? So, okay, I think we have um, touched upon the liquidity um, topic a bit, but yeah, any additional thoughts on that? Do you think there's a, like a major risk like what we've seen over the couple of last weeks and months? I think we always say that you should, when you're buying an ETF, you should judge, oh, there are a couple of factors on how to judge it, but first of all, you should look at the asset class that that ETF is based on, because that is your risk. You know, you, whether, whether you're buying, uh, in, you know, you're buying directly into bonds or that are high yield, or you're buying an ETF exposed to high yield bonds, you're still buying high yield bonds. So that's important to take into account. The second consideration, and this was in this the question here is, you know, how is ETF constructed? Is it synthetic? Is it physical? Um, and, you know, if you're buying a synthetic ETF, um, it may not be that much riskier, but you have introduced an additional risk because you've introduced counterparty risk into that into that ETF, which, you know, or versus a physical compatriot, maybe uh, a physical peer rather would would just be, uh, you know, just just the, invest, the the risk of the underlying asset class. So I think those are two things to consider. And, you know, lastly, um, we would always say, though, you know, I, ex uh, you know, I accept that we're, you know, we're in a, we're in a privileged position to say so, but if you're, you should, you should really use an ETF provider that has experience managing that particular asset class, um, which may seem quite self-serving, but I, I think the point there they're trying to make is that part of what you see, the ability for, you know, we talked about high yield ETFs earlier, the ability for them to absorb huge amounts of liquidity uh, and daily daily trading uh, in these mar in these periods of market stress is not just because you've built a good product, but what's behind that product is the infrastructure. It's the it's the banks that you're partnering with uh, who are willing to be market makers. It's the uh, 
uh, and you know participating dealers in in that and willing to take you know some risk themselves. One thing I'd like. Uh, I want, also want to ask you about, you know, since you're based in uh, Hong Kong, I mean, what do you think of the Hong Kong and Singapore market? They're relatively small. You think, you know, we, to be honest, we don't really use them that much. Uh, even if we have to use exposure on Hong Kong markets, we actually, we might buy an ETF or use it listed over off, offshore. Uh, you, you know, I know most of it is in Japan and uh, not really big. And in this uh, Morningstar uh, thing study done, uh, both Hong Kong and Singapore rate as below average in terms of fee expenses, et cetera, on some of these uh, products. Um, so what do, what do you think about the, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore? Will, yeah. will we be buying? Uh, I, I think that's changing. Uh, I think Hong Kong particularly is, uh, you know, expanding as a, and, you know, its capabilities as, a, as an ETF listing venue. And I think some of the driver for that is, you know, Hong Kong has traditionally been a place where you buy ETFs if you want to get access to onshore China, um, you know, go and buy China A shares, uh, or you want to go and buy Hong Kong domestic domestic says so you know the Hong Kong tracker fund very famous um, so but what's changing is the ability to, for investors to access international asset classes uh, through Hong Kong uh, and what we're seeing is yeah there have been a number of funds that have listed that have offered that but we're beginning to see liquidity build in pockets of the market so for example if you wanted to buy uh, into other Asian equities whether that be you know other other single countries or broad Asian i.e you know multiple countries in one ETF that's beginning to attract um, some assets and liquidity um, wh why do I think that the Hong Kong has not had that so far uh, and it comes really back to that point we talked about a little bit earlier on on regulation so if you've seen the US is by far and away the largest ETF market. Um, the reason for that is because, um, you know, partly because uh, a, well, it's the world's largest, largest uh, securities market to start with. But secondly, because regulation has allowed, uh, you know, different types of investors to participate. And the, the drive towards sort of fee based advice meant that a lot of retail investors will use ETFs in their portfolios. Uh, in the US in the way that um, in the way that uh, you don't see when it comes to um, you know return investors perhaps in Hong Kong but that is changing uh, yeah one more one thing I also wanted to cover we, we covered all the good points and so on and so forth and uh, you know also disadvantage is how they can you know uh, which which investors are they not suitable for let's say uh, you know one of the things of course i i, I uh, would consider immediately is the liquidity uh, i.e that you know uh, you have to be very careful to go into etfs that are liquid because you might be ending up paying a huge bit offer spread etc so even though the expense ratio may be very small I, it's just that you know there isn't any enough liquidity on it uh, on a daily basis for you to exit uh, uh, exit the position when you want and also uh, you know there's some of them are leverage sector specific of too narrow etc so what, what what's your view on what kind of investors is it not suitable for yeah I, I, you know I, re I think this these points you've highlighted are you know absolutely right so you know bid offer spreads liquidity there's kind of two those there's, there's really a, a tied to each other um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, that's that's an important consideration, particularly you know if you're investing in smaller amounts, you've got to you've got to think what it will cost you to buy into that ETF, and you know the narrower those spreads, um, the less it's going to cost you to do. Um, brokerage costs, you know, transaction costs sort of play into that same theme. Premium discounts to NAV, um, you know, those can be to your advantage or not, depending on that. You can take a view on that if you want to. I'd say the other thing to consider is is tax. Um, and you know, Vivek, you touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, but if you know, if you're a Hong Kong or a Singapore investor, you're typically going to be taxed uh, if you buy a, a U.S. listed vehicle. You're going to have uh, you know 30% withholding tax on any distributions or like dividends or um, you know the coupon from um, from fixed income on those on those ETFs. So I think that, that that plays a little bit to some of the points you made earlier about why why Hong Kong's perhaps not um, developed if you look at uh, as an ETF market in the same way as, as other as other exchanges. Um, if you look at, um, you know, one of the large drivers of 
some of the clients I look after. Um, so I look after everything from, you know, uh, retail investors, you know, the man in the street to um, also private banks. And, you know, private banks have the ability to go and offer their clients uh, ETFs that are listed elsewhere because it's within a within a portfolio. And, you know, often that flexibility has meant that they've offered, uh, they've used USITS ETFs, i.e. Yeah. Ones, ones from Europe. Yeah. Yeah. The, we also kind of, uh, you know, we have different ones because, you know, we to the retail customers, you know, a small portfolio, we typically go for ETS because the brokerage and the commission are lowest there. And for, uh, the, you know, withholding tax doesn't matter that much, but it's the commission which is important. And for the larger investors, uh, you know, who have a big allocation and, you know, will stick with it for a long time, uh, we offer usage. So we offer both of them and, you know, match it off between the commission paid and the brokerage paid versus the withholding tax impact of this. Uh, do we have any time for another last question, Barbara, from the participants or? Yes, so actually one question, actually two questions, one for each of you. So one is uh, something that I find in interesting. I hope some, uh, one of you got uh, like an answer for that is how to avoid pitfalls like trading errors. And what is the redress that investors, uh, for investors that got burned? Um, yeah, I'm happy to, yeah. Um, uh, uh, trading errors, I think, uh, are related to your, really a question to do with your broker. Uh, and um, you should be recompensed if they've made an error on your behalf. Okay. And lastly, uh, from my side, uh, Vivek, um, I think we also got a couple of questions on Crystal itself. So not all of our attendees to, to the, tonight might already be clients. So could you maybe in a very short pitch tell uh, all our listeners what Crystal is about and why the money is safe with us? Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, well, one thing which we definitely do, uh, which I want to like cover, uh, where is it? There's one slide I, you know, I have. Uh, I can't seem to find it, but you know, that like for for uh, for ETFs, it's very important. I mean, there are some disadvantages, so it's very important for us for somebody to actually filter out the ETFs and make uh, you know figure out which are the right ones for you. So we definitely do the entire filtering exercise uh, to make sure that the ETFs are suitable for you. Um, but of course, Crystal is more than just ETFs. Crystal is a platform uh, for, to do asset allocation for all our investors and. Uh, it just happens that ETFs meet most of the needs that we're trying to satisfy. Uh, but in some cases, it may not, uh, in which cases we also have, uh, you know, uh, for high net worth individuals, for private wealth, so client customers, we also have uh, hedge funds, access to uh, private equity, access to uh, even a cryptocurrency uh, fund, uh, and so on and so forth. So depending upon the need, what we're trying to do is, again, build a very uh, efficient, uh, independent, transparent platform uh, that meets your needs to, uh, you know, invest efficiently. And that's, that's what the whole uh, objective of the platform is. And, so, and a lot of it is met through ETF. Some of it is met through access to other funds and so on and so forth. And we continue to do that, uh, you know, uh, to the best of our ability and make it as transparent as possible. So this is something which, you know, in US, you know, the, the ETF market in US is quite developed. And so is the market for what we're kind of doing is also quite developed in uh, US but obviously not so much in Hong Kong and Singapore. So we are kind of the leaders of that in, in this space. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers that question. <laughs> Perfect. Um, if we have one minute left, maybe, um, do you um, also uh, want to share any market views <laughs> that you have left? So we have got one question that's basically asking for a crystal ball. So is it a good time to buy into S&P 500 now? So any, any market shares that you want to, to share with our viewers before we, before we end this uh, webinar? Um, yeah, I, we are overweight US equities, is what I'd say at this point, uh, marginally. So um, it could be, <laughs> uh, but, I'm, but I'm not gonna give a, you know, a prediction on, on where I think the S&P will, will end up this year. Absolutely, understand. Okay, so I think that's it for, uh, from us for tonight. Thank you so much, Anthony and, and Vivek for, for uh, having this discussion with us tonight. And thank you all of our attendees for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So on your way out, like dear, <laughs> dear attendees, um, <laughs> you will find a, a link to a, uh, to a survey, to a very short Google form. And it would help us tremendously if you could uh, just open that and fill in that uh, short survey. So we would be very happy for your help there.
Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Stay safe.